Hello, this is Genealogy Quick Star, and I'm going to cover and uncover my face this time. Hi, how are you? I'm Shamel, and I am your host today for Genealogy Quick Star. And I am also a proud producer at Philly Cam, and that stands for Philly Community Access Media, the Cam. And we believe that community should have a voice. And that's the same for Genealogy Quick Start. We believe in the community having a voice. So let us know where you are. Um, and since this show is online, we have a wonderful, broad audience. So from all over, we want to know where you are. Um, and please share your genealogy group too, because you know that genealogy groups are the key to a successful journey um, when searching for your ancestors. So let's talk about those ancestors. Today, we will not only talk about researching ancestors, we are also gonna talk about researching the living. We haven't done that yet. Um, and so we have Kelvin Myers, who's a forensic genealogist, and he's here to teach about searching for heirs. And, you know, he's the guy, he's the real guy with the real inheritance money who is now having a very, very hard time with his job because of one of the top scams. <laughs> I don't know if it's across the world, at least in America, is someone calling you saying that they have inheritance money for you. And you know what I do, me? Click on, I don't even, you know, click, I don't know you. So today, Kelvin is going to provide the steps for finding heirs of this state. But first, let's bring on my favorite genealogist, a columnist and editor and Man, a prolific author. You know who it is, Jim Beidler. Hello, Jim. How are you? I am well, and you? I'm doing great. Next, you guys know who he is. He is the author of Genealogy Tip of the Day. And one of, you know, I'm going to do kind of a genealogy of genealogy blogs because if we did, you would be probably at the top of the one of the beginning blogs out there, aren't you, Michael? <laughs> In the early days, I don't want to give my age away to make Jim feel bad, so we're not going to talk about that. But <laughs> <laughs> so it's okay, today, Michael. You, you're always going to look older than me. That's that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> hey, I've seen your better. you shared your birth certificate online, so I know how old you are. So it's all good. Um, <laughs> So today we're going to talk about marriage records. So marriage records are pretty cool. So is there, um, have either of you had either like a, a marriage surprise, like when you found the record, you were, you know, it's something you didn't expect, or is there kind of like a common mistake that people often make with marriage, looking for marriage records that you want to kind of dispel uh, the myth and help everyone out. Boy, there. I thought this was going to be a little short intro question. Um, you I think one or the personal, other. You personal personal the surprises other. in marriage records sounds like a rabbit hole we're not going down. Um, so I I would say, I think there was one neat record. I was told you don't need to borrow with it. The license won't tell you anything. This was 1850s in Illinois. And it turned out there was a letter of consent from the woman's parents in there, which I was not expecting, and it, it documented that relationship. And if I just ignored it, because I thought I didn't need it, I wouldn't have found it. So it kind of goes back to make certain, as we're going to talk about today, make certain you look at um, every possible record created during the process of marriage, applications through the license, through the return, everything. Make sure you've seen it, it all, because there could be a clue in one of those um, that you weren't aware of. And so today we're going to talk about marriages, but it's called marriage civilly speaking. So what are we not talking about, Jim? What are we not going to talk about today as far as marriages go? Right. We're, we're not going to talk about religious records of marriage, uh, which uh, as you go back in time, a lot of times uh, you don't have uh, civil registry or civil certificates they or licenses, they weren't required. Uh, but when you talk about surprises, one of mine 
came out of uh, a religious uh, marriage where my great one set of great grandparents were married on the day their first child was baptized. And of course, at the time, I thought this was incredibly shocking. Now it's kind of like, yeah, what, you know, <laughs> but, no, but no, we're, we're not going to talk about uh, uh, marriages uh, performed in a church or by a pastor in his home uh, or uh, marriage records that appear in newspapers, uh, all those sorts of things. We're going to stick to the civil ones. Okay. So the title for, t oh, were you going to really say something? All I was going to say is the uncivil ones end in divorce, and that's court records, and we're not discussing those today either. <laughs> either. Um, that's, we that's need a show reason. on that. Those are that's, the fun ones. Yeah. Those are really exciting. <laughs> so today, our quick start is going to be married, civilly speaking. And so let's look at step one, which is determine a time. So we don't. We only have one of the crosshairs. Like it looks like you might have. Like, why do we start with just a time? Well, be because uh, as as I alluded to, uh, the I, I don't think I don't really think there's anywhere in America that they started keeping civil marriages immediately upon uh, commencement uh, of of the of the colony. Uh, so so uh, you need to to specify you need to figure out whether these records even exist new yeah. england started pretty early but early. Jim's, jim's state of pennsylvania lagging in everything um <laughs> i don't think it was 1870s 1880s before it really became a requirement to have a civil record of the marriage 1885 see it was even later than i thought um but you've got to you've got to determine a <laughs> time shocking. i was just so shocked by well that. you know it's it's slackers that's what, what we say <laughs> but you've got to determine a time because that's going to affect what records were created and we've we mentioned before you want to get everything so that time is crucial because state statute or colonial practice or what have you dictated what records were created that's going to vary from one place to another and from one time to another all right, so we're starting with time first. So that's step one. Get yourself in a time. And now step two. Oh, we have the other crosshair. We now have a place. So marriages had to take place at a place, right? Yes, they did. And it's you can get married. It isn't like a birth or a death where it's got to be recorded. Well, the marriage is recorded where it happens, but you can go somewhere to make it happen, different from a death or a death or a birth. And so you don't want to assume they got married exactly in the county where they were living. They might have crossed the county line. They might have crossed the state line. State lines are more likely to happen because the laws will be different and it might have been easier to get married quickly. They might go two or three counties over because nobody knows their paw at that courthouse or something of that of that <laughs> nature. But it's not like other records that, you know, they died there, boom, it's going to be recorded there. They could have gone somewhere to get married. So you've got to be maybe thinking outside your locality box for a little bit when you're thinking about so it. Can you guys dispel this? I don't understand what's going on. I was looking for my mom, my grandmother and my grandfather. Cause I first, I couldn't understand why she even married my grandfather. And then I found out they eloped. Like she ran away to marry him in Elkton, Maryland. What is the deal with Elkton, Maryland? Like, why did that happen? Why so many people go there? It's simple. No waiting period. Ah. Yep. So, but uh, uh, just going off of uh, Michael's point, I know in Pennsylvania, the marriage license, you can apply in any county of Pennsylvania, and it's valid for a marriage uh, that then is... Uh, uh, done in any of the uh, other counties. So was so, that done even the earlier earlier days before yep. they had a state registration? Well, like, that well the, before they had state registration, there's no no law regarding it. So oh, yeah, that's true. This <laughs> gets a little crazier. In most advanced <laughs> cultures, you it's usually within the county. We're making a little bit of a dig there, but it's usually within the county. Um, and when the, that's the problem when there are no statewide indexes. If you don't know the county where it took place, you've got to be looking from one county to Seven another. Minutes. Yeah. All right. Let's move on to step three because you guys have so much search for marriage records. So let's go ahead and look at what you've uh, shared with me. Uh, let's see. Window. 
Yeah, you guys have a whole bunch here. So let's start with this one. It is. This is a marriage register from 18, 1880s in Illinois. And one of the things that we tried to do was get a variety in terms of what content was in the records, what things they asked, what things they didn't ask. This is uh, the, the marriage register, the list. In this case, they were on some of these, you'll see names of parents and where they're born, but not every couple filled that um, uh, out on the application. Uh, this is the register. The application was filled out by the bride and groom. They transcribed that into this, uh, the marriage register. This is separate from the license. It's separate from the other documents. This is just one document. Um, uh, and usually when we're looking at marriage records, there's a groom's index and a bride's index. Um, you want to remember that you've got to know what name the bride used at the point in time of that marriage. Had she, was it a maiden name? Had she been married before? And you don't know about it. So you want to be thinking about those things when you're looking for people in these um, in these indexes. But this is typical of the time. It's also typical where a lot of people, there's a lot of blanks in there because they chose not to answer those questions. Now, tell me, tell me, Michael, uh, this register, the, the licenses and applications that go along with this, have they been retained too? Yes. As records? Oh, okay. No, no, I, in most, in most yeah. locations, yes. This was simply compiled from the, the license application. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's that, cause, cause, well, and some people are not going to know. They're going to think this is it as far as the civil record right. and, and not realize you have those other things yeah. that might have more right. information. And the, the, nice th the nice thing is if one is more difficult to read than the other, you've got, this is technically, this would be a transcription or a derivative copy from the original, but you've got it written down one more. But if they kept this record, it's written down one more place that may be more legible um, than another. That name in the middle there is not DeMop. It's DeMoss. We're not going to have our double S lecture. It's not DeMop. DeMop. It's oh, DeMoss. Yeah. <laughs> and I will let Shamel move on to the next slide because I know she's <laughs> wanting to keep us on track. And so this one, you're calling it a marriage. Oh, I this like this. A, I've never seen gentlemen's ladies' names. Uh, this, this is also from the same location about maybe 15 years earlier or so. Um, not as much information in this marriage record. Um, mm -hmm. This is one that's alphabetical in nature. Um, want to think about how it was sorted so it's it, it's alphabetical there's a section for the men there's a section for the for the for the females by uh, first letter of the last name when you're, you're looking at some document you've not seen before you want to think about how it's organized to help you search as, as effectively as you as you can this again is not the complete record i think there's another page where it and with this column, like here, as far as like leading you to something, we are not, not talking about church marriages, but right. MG, JP. Right, because right. the officiant, just because we're not talking about church marriage records, doesn't mean that these marriages didn't take place in a church. Um, it's just we're talking about the civil record of that of that marriage. Several of these were done by a minister of the gospel. A few looks like by a justice of the peace. And then this dude named Ditto. He does a lot of work in a lot of places. Um, he does. He or she does a. No one knows their gender, but Ditto does a lot of stuff. Um, this moves back a little bit earlier. I put this one in here on purpose because it's hard to read. I love this, it. I love uh, it. it. It can be read. It's from 1864 in uh, extreme eastern Nebraska. Be it remembered that on the seventh day of April, A.D. 1864, I joined in matrimony oh. Benjamin Butler and Nancy Jane Wolf at my house in the something uh, present David Wolf and somebody else. So pro David or Daniel, probably a brother or something. And I do oh, have that. Michael. I can't remember what those what those locations are off the top of my head. We got some uh, gazetteer and something else to kind of speculate what that what that location might be. But some of these are not going to be easy to read. In this case, this is all there is. There's just this entry in the. I forget if they call it the register or the ledger, but this is it. There, there's no application at this point in time. At that point in time in Nebraska, that was it. You're lucky I have to have a lot of marriage records from the 1800s that look like that. Yeah, I'm not was, upset. I'm not upset at all. Right, and for for that time period <laughs> to actually have the names of the witnesses sometimes is unusual. I was lucky; it's got the witnesses there. One of whom is probably the bride's brother or male relative in some way, shape, or form. So I love this that we're about to see here. 
Booyah, lots of information here. Talk about this. This is a 1907 marriage. It's an application, what we call the application for the marriage license. Uh, the bride and groom have signed it. I don't know if you got a bigger um, image of that. There we go. Um, the front is just the name of the bride and the groom, date of issued. Mm -hmm. They got married the same day. So they must have taken it to the uh, they were married in a church and then it was filed six days later. It's got the groom's name, where he lived, his occupation, age next birthday. Sometimes in these marriages, that's how it will be phrased. So when you make sure when you're looking at an age, does it say age on this date or age next birthday? Because that's his 26 and the same thing down there for her, uh, yeah. her 25. It's got place of birth, names of parents. For the Love groom. names of Same parents. thing for the... Uh, same thing for the bride. And mm -hmm. then there's two uh, two witnesses down there. It looks like his sister and her. Yeah, they know, have the we don't know that, family. but it's it's his sister and her brother. Uh, love this. Love witnesses. this. I love all that information. Married on Christmas Eve in the church parsonage. I love it. And here's another. This is the mar a marriage license. Marriage license and application. It's from Westmoreland County in Western Pennsylvania. And this is very shortly after Pennsylvania started keeping marriage licenses, but yet they have a lot of really good information like the names of the, the parents, mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, when you, when you have, you know, if you have somebody starting genealogy relatively recently, if they hook into these marriage licenses that list the parents, you, you can get a heck of a family tree just yes, from this yeah. one record group, just from really this one record quick. group. But now what, what's, uh, what's also interesting to me is uh, that this early, they were this detailed, mm -hmm. but in, they didn't stay that detailed in all of Pennsylvania's counties. And I don't know if they got overwhelmed or, or uh, sub somebody decided to just, just uh, buy a more simple ledger book. Uh, but if we go to the, to the next example. I just of, need to go through and look for all the, look at question number three for all of them. Relationships of parties, either by blood or marriage. Well, <laughs> you, can, you, can, you can look in that, but it's, it's seldom accurate. So. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'd, I'd say that one has the least least uh, opportunity to be to be accurate, but uh, oh yeah, and this was this was also pointing out that there's usually two parts to these uh, that there's an application and then there's the certificate that's returned showing that yeah they were actually married, uh, or there are times when this is blank. Uh, yeah, and, oh, and 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 then there is some question, got to be some question in your mind. Did the actual marriage take place? take place? I would say probably in most cases it just wasn't returned by the JP or whoever was the was the person. Uh, but it's 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 a reason for you to dig further. I have seen canceled written across it in yeah. huge. I yeah. should have used that as an yeah. illustration. It was from Oklahoma in huge letters. The <laughs> clerk just went crazy from bottom left to top right. He just. <laughs> You so let me just tell you, my family is very religious and the people who we were marriage certificate like is responsible for all of us. And if you want to see Floyd sweat, he was sweating. I was sitting in next to him in the microfilm machine when he found that that register. Right. And it was blank <laughs> where it was like <laughs> that it was that was completed. He was blank and he was just like I, I could feel his heat. And then like a couple of lines lower. It was rewritten again, and there it had the actual marriage date. Wow. <laughs> I'm, gl I'm, gl I'm glad Floyd was able to tile <laughs> off. So. <laughs> yeah, so here, that one, one was from 1886, and we were marveling at how detailed it was. And now you gave us another one from the same place from 1909. Yeah, and this kind of defies the expectations that the closer in time the records are the more detailed there they would be because like i say for some for some reason i see this in several of pennsylvania's counties uh in the early 1900s they adopted this register book that that uh, didn't ask for the parents names no. uh, now you still get them sometimes if somebody was under age because then they had to to fill out the consent part and then on the other hand they do have they do ask for exact birth dates, 
yeah. uh, where, whereas it's just ages in the uh, in the others. So it's a it's a little bit of a mixed bag. But I you know like I say I I get used to these being a go to. A record group for making intergenerational connections and I was kind of flummoxed I first saw one of these about 15 years ago in client work and I'm thinking oh yeah well, the marriage licenses that's going to get me a few generations and then I get to this part and it's and it, it's it's say it isn't so so I love this it has the um former like the married before and it's dissolved by death and mm -hmm. it has the date. I love that. I I don't think I've seen that. Now um, that's yeah, movie. that's that's fairly fairly standard because because they were that they, they were they were trying to prevent bigamy. And, you know, they had <laughs> outlawed the Mormons from doing it, so they so they felt maybe we better enforce this with the rest of the population. Um, but again, you know, the the absolute accuracy. Who knows. So those were, we just looked at like different types of marriage licenses, applications, uh, registers. Those are kind of the things that we're used to seeing. Um, I want to show you something here that some that we aren't so used to seeing. This one is a marriage affidavit. What is, that? why is it there an a, affidavit? A marriage affidavit served a roughly similar purpose to a marriage bond, which we're also going to. Uh, going to take a look at as well, but this was required, and and again, we're talking state statute dictates what's required and what's not. But at this point in time in Illinois, when you got married, it was usually the groom uh, filled out an affidavit, and basically what he's saying is the bride and I are of age, and there's no legal impediment for us to be uh, to be married. Um, are these generally extant alone, or would they come with other of those possible the, the, registers? In and this situation, registers? this is filed with the returned marriage license in okay. a packet. Fantastic. Um, but no, these in, in this point in time, these were loose papers. They were not bound in a volume like the ledgers or the journals. Okay. Um, Letter of consent from mother for son to marry. <laughs> What's going on here? Well, this dude, uh, William... It must have been William Thomas, must have been under the age of consent Oops, in Kentucky sorry. in 1829. And so for him to legally get married, his guardian or his parent is going to have to sign off on this. His father was dead, so his mother has um, signed, made her mark on this document, written to the county clerk, giving him permission to, uh, to get married. My uh, ancestor, or the uncle of the, of the boy getting married, as a witness, also a slight chance, based on the handwriting, he might have actually written it. I'm not sure. Um, Sophia didn't because she made her she made her mark. Mm -hmm. But here in this letter of consent, we've got um, it's proving Sophia Thomas is William A. Thomas's mother, and the spelling, you know, is pretty typical of the era. But you can you can make it out. So was um, this found in this is found in court records or was no it this this was with, this was with the marriage record. This was with the marriage license. Um, okay, with the actual license. Okay, right. so this was additional to with the marriage packet. Okay, very right. cool. Be, be, because he was underage. This is an application for a license. It's kind of similar to the one that Jim had. The the no, this is the license. At the top of it is the license giving them permission to get married. At the bottom is the return indicating. Um, so why do you why do you call it the returned license? Be. Because it was the license that was returned to the county clerk, they had to send it back. They it had to, to it had to be returned. It had to be returned with uh, uh, date and place, not miss, not necessarily the place, but the date and the officiant of the marriage. Okay, once the marriage was actually once the marriage had been sent completed, it back, yeah. And this is how they would then record that date into their okay ledger or journal. That's why it's called the marriage returns. Okay. Okay. And is that common? I'm not used to seeing these on the places that I've researched. Or maybe uh, I was looking at them and not. In realizing. some places they are, but I mean, it, you'd have to have the license to get married. You take the license to the officiant to show you had the license, and then that would be that would be returned. Okay. Very cool. And I think those were all of the ones that you shared for marriages. So let's talk about that was step three. So basically, you're searching your county um, 
look and, and seeing what you can find, not just looking definitely for right. one type of marriage. All right. Make sure you've gotten everything. And the one thing we didn't have an example of are marriage bonds, which are more of a Southern mm -hmm. uh, Southern tradition, yeah. uh, particularly before the Civil War. The, the marriage bond, that's basically, it's, it's guaranteeing the couple has no legal impediment to marriage. That's the legal purpose of it. There's, there'll be a value stated on the bond. That's not cash they had to pay. The value of the bond was a penalty if it turned out the bride had been married before and hadn't divorced or the groom was really only 12 or some craziness. And then that was the amount that would have to be paid if there was an impediment to marriage. But it's not a, it's not the license fee. The stated amount of the bond was governed by state statute if they couldn't get married. But that's a Southern thing. But you want to make certain you look for those because sometimes there will be it will say the relationship of the person vouching for them. Sometimes it won't, but you don't know until you look. Okay. Okay. Love that nugget. Love it. Let's move on to step four, which is to then analyze each document. Some of what we have gone through here. Um, is there anything else that you want to add to analyzing the document? Of course, you're going to pull all those extra people, like the ones who had the same surnames and figure out right. who they are and what their relationship is. Any other analysis? I would say really two quick things. One, if, if one witness is related, it's possible the other one is not, and it's just their boyfriend or girlfriend. I've seen that in some cases. And Jim mentioned people lying on a marriage application. Probably the biggest thing no. they actually... He was concerned about these people being bigamist and polygamist and other kinds of agamist. But I think the biggest concern with accuracy on a marriage application is their age. Um, of all the things, if you think about the things a person is most likely to lie about on a marriage application, I mean, once you're over 40, it doesn't matter. But if you're in that younger range where legally getting married is an issue, you know, the, the age legally, of or, or getting married without consent. Oh, exactly. I, right. I think exactly. that's generally yeah, yeah, yeah. the issue is they really don't want dad to find out. So is it so, they don't so want heck yeah, I'm 18. Yeah. <laughs> So guys push their ages up and women push their ages down. <laughs> just over the age, just over the, if you want to get married, okay, you may tell him you're younger, but okay. All of a sudden now I'm 19 or I'm right. 18 or whatever the, the magic, <laughs> you know, usually then, it's 18 for a female and 21 for a male, 21 but that can, for a male. that can vary. Okay. We're that all 18 and 21 guys. Step five is then to document your findings. Let's take a look at all the steps together. First, for marriage, married, civilly speaking. So step one is determine the time. It's all about time. Uh, then go to determine a place. Step three is to search for marriage records. Step four is to analyze each document. And step five is to document your findings. So thank you so much. That was so much fun talking about married, civilly speaking. So thank you, Michael. Thank you, Jim. Hopefully I will see you guys for the question of the day. <laughs> Hello, and let's get ready for our second quick start. Before we do, I want to say hi to everyone. I hate when I don't get a chance. I forget to say hi. Hello, Paula. Paula's number one today from West Defford. There we are, Gary. How are you? Gary's always in the top five when he's here. Oh, my goodness. Mark Lowe's here. Hello, Mark from Springfield, Tennessee. Hello, Benita Gale from North Carolina. Dean Henry from AAGG. I saw your cool SAR pictures, Dean. Congratulations. Hello, Tammy from ATL. Mildred from Texas. Hey, Mildred. We have uh, Jean Lucas, or is it Jean Lucas Allen? Not sure, from Collegeville, PA. Hey, Angela Allen from Houston. And we have me, me, and Wayne. We couldn't get this party started till Wayne got here. Wayne and Grace Ann. Hello, Grace Ann. It is nice to meet you from Magnolia, just down the street from me. All right, guys, let's go ahead and get started with our second um, quick start. This is our first time, I think. Kelvin is breaking us in. We only look for dead people around here. This is all about dead people, right? But now um, we are going to look for living people. And I know that's got to be difficult because you know the dead people are hard enough, right? 
And so poor Kelvin, right? Kelvin's trying to make a living here and trying to connect people with their inheritances. And guess what the number one scam is? Hello, we have some money for you. Tell us all your business so we can really rip you off. So how does Kelvin do his job when he's the real thing and he has all these fakers out there? So let's bring Kelvin out and find out how he does this. Hey, Kelvin, how you doing? Hey there, how are you? I'm good. <laughs> Kelvin, you're a little low, your volume. Ah, you can't hear me? We need to hear everything that you are saying, buddy. Is it so, nice? so Kelvin, before we find out how you live the real life when you have all these fakers out there, I'd love to hear your one minute genealogy or origin story. How'd you get started? And when did you know that you were addicted to genealogy? I got interested in genealogy as a kid, uh, kind of back in the days of the bicentennial and wanted to get into that. I went to Texas Tech University in Lubbock, Texas, got a degree in history, thinking I wanted to teach Texas history. And I did my student teaching at Smiley Wilson Junior High in Lubbock, Texas, and swore to God, if he got me out of there alive, I would never teach again. <laughs> I never over the years. So I graduated, I moved to Dallas. I started working on my own genealogy at the Dallas Public Library. And a part-time job opened up. I took that and I worked part-time weekends and on Monday nights for a while. And then that turned into a 10 year stint at Dallas Public Library. In the you got to hang out with the man, Lloyd Boxtra. Oh my goodness. How was, was that? Nice. How was that? I, I can't tell you what I learned in those 10 years. <laughs> it was, it, he was, he was a great guy and it was, I did learn quite a bit being there with him. Absolutely. Just the brief times that, so I'm going to tell you a secret. Like when I first met Lloyd, I was so excited. I took his class because all of the instructors at IGHR bragged about how they took Lloyd's intermediate class. Oh, I was in Lloyd's class. I was in Lloyd's class. So I said, okay, I got to take Lloyd's class. And I think that's the year I miss you in African-American class. But when I got there, Lloyd didn't have the traditional handout. And Lloyd was not the traditional speaker. Right. I'm used to like these detailed handouts and he'd give you like these like, you know, definitions. But when, but when Lloyd started talking and Kelvin, your volume is still low. When Lloyd started talking, it you were just totally, completely just captured by everything that he said. So you were a lucky guy. Let me hear your volume, Kelvin. Is this better? Yes, it's better. Thank Very you. Good. So um, today you are going to talk about something that you do for a living, which is finding heirs of the estate. So Kelvin, how do you exist in this world of fakers when you do the real deal? Like what, what, so <laughs> what, what happens when you call people most often to, you know, tell them that they get money? <laughs> I spend a good deal of my time trying to make people understand that this is not a scam. <laughs> I, and I, you know, I don't want your social security number. You know, I don't want to know all your business. I just need an address so that we can uh, get you the information that you are actually going to inherit some money from someone that you probably don't know. <laughs> Kelvin, I am here when you need to call me. I just, you know, no worries. I will not give you a hard time. Well, as I tell everybody, you got to remember that at some point I have to go to court before a judge and swear that the people I found are the real people that belong to this estate. So, you know, I won't call you without knowing that you're a part of the estate. Okay. Love it. So let's move to step one for finding heirs of the estate. So step one is to obtain the death certificate of the deceased. And normally that's given to me by the attorney that's hired me. Okay. So I've got that information. The death certificate, when you're in this time period right now, you as if you're not related to that person, you can't get a copy of the death certificate. Right. I was going to ask you, how are we supposed to do that, Kelvin? Yeah. So that, that comes to me from the attorney. Uh, for those who aren't related closely enough or not related at all, then you need to look at the online obituaries. Um, 
because that's going to give you a lot of information that you're going to use. And it's one way to kind of circumvent not having the death certificate. Okay. And um, does it take still, how long does it take for the social security, for them to show up in the social security death index? Three years. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So obituaries are the best way to go. <laughs> and so many people today aren't putting obituaries in newspapers because it costs too much, but they are, they are, they are online. You, the, and the funeral home offers that as a part of, of what they're doing, right? Right, right? Okay. And so you ready for step two? Sure. So we have the death certificate or some death information like the obituary. And so step two is then to research the deceased. And you provided us with something interesting that I've never seen before called the um, application to determine airship. Talk to us about this. This is a document again that I normally get from the attorney or from the court. This is a this is a record in the court that's a public record. So if you know that someone has passed away and they the application they are going forward to probate their estate, then you can get a copy of this application to determine airship, which normally tells you uh, a few things about the person, their name. Um, it may also tell you um, who the uh, their date of death, it may tell you at least how old they are if it doesn't tell you um, their date of birth. But you can use this to help you get started. This woman, at the time of her death, was 68 years old. Uh, this was in 2019. So I needed to start looking on the census to see if I can find her. We use I use Ancestry.com and basic genealogy every day because we've got to start with the known, work for the unknown, and so we would want to find her on the 1940 census to find out who her parents are. Does she have siblings? Is she an only child? You know, and if that's the case, then we need to look at who are the cousins on each side of the family. Are you skipping ahead? Okay, so we're researching now. We researched the deceased, right? And if you are lucky, you can get this, uh, that application. And so um, you, let's move on to step three, which you said, which is to search for siblings, right? right. Well, so I asked, like, to me, this is like the key here. You know, this is when you start looking for possible living people. Um, what are your top four places that you go to on the internet to search for siblings and you gave this is one of them and talk to us about like how you do this and what you're looking how what types of searches and why do you like been verified well i gave you four different ones um and i will tell you that if you are you know you can use most of these for free to a certain degree but you may have to pay to use some of these websites i have a subscription to these because I need to know all the information that's in there. And I want to compare the information, let's say from been verified to white pages or checkmate to see if it's the, if it's the same person. Uh, Intellius is another great website because this is gonna give you names, places, uh, hopefully current phone numbers or cell phone numbers. Um, and who else, who else they may be related to to help you put that family back together that you're trying to piece together here. Okay, so you have been verified, Checkmate, Intellis, and the White Pages. Right. And so, you know, if I were to just pick one, you can only do one. Like, I want to maybe try their free trial. Like you said, you can kind of use a little bit of them. But if I were to go ahead and spend, like, spend some time, maybe getting a small membership, which one would you suggest get? And I know you're not being paid by these people to promote them. <laughs> no. uh, I would say whitepages.com for the price and to, you know, when, when you're just trying to look for somebody. Let's say you're working on trying to get your 40th class reunion together and you're trying to find people's addresses. White Pages, the paid version of White Pages is a really good place to start. So what do they provide to you is mostly addresses and phone numbers, the White Pages. Do they give you anything else? addresses, phone numbers, and they also sometimes give possible relatives. Ah, okay, okay. Then you'll also get, if they live like an apartment complex, you'll get the people that live around them. 
And in my case, I'm sometimes trying to, you know, to get a hold of them. And I have been known to call a neighbor and say, hey, would you tell your next door neighbor that he's getting a phone call and it's not a scam? I really do have money for it. Give me a call back. You know. Oh, OK. OK. That's interesting. And so what does it say? OK, so what is it? Is there anything on, say, been verified that's unique um, information that you might not get from the other three? Um, no, there's really not. It's just the ability to compare, you know, who has the most current address, okay. what, who has the most current phone number. Uh, and again, it, there's really not, it, some of them are updated more frequently than others. Mm -hmm. Let's say somebody has recently passed away. It takes about six months, three to six months to get them onto white pages as deceased. Okay. Sometimes it's a little faster on being verified. Okay. Okay. And so the next one, you next step you have is to um, search for the first cousin. So you're kind of doing the same thing. And when is, are there state laws that go to a certain level? Like if they don't, if, if they're not siblings that they don't inherit or second cousins don't inherit. Yeah. There in certain states, there are. Uh, they're only you know, if if you're no if you're no closer related than a second cousin, then the estate as s cheats to that particular state, whether it's New York. It or what it, it, s, it s cheats e s c h e a t s. It cheats it <laughs> s cheats. So you York. mean the states cheats and takes your money? Takes your money. There you go. <laughs> now, fortunately, here in Texas, we do not have that law, and so we just keep looking for someone who's related to you. They may be your ninth cousin four times removed, but we just keep looking till we find living people. So I find that interesting. Who gets your money? Does the town get it? Does the county get it? Does the state get it? The, if there's no, if there, we don't find anybody, it goes to the state, of te, to that particular state. So it goes to the state. I wonder if there's a line item that shows how much is cheated each year. <laughs> well, in Texas, we have a website called Unclaimed Property. Oh, yes. that So that's what that website is for, to help to find people. Because it sits there for seven years, and you can go through that to see if you've got money from, you know, in a leftover savings account or, you know, whatever. So did you have any interesting first cousin finds? Uh, <laughs> I did uh, several years ago. I did an estate where one of the first cousins ended up being a uh, well-known painter in, uh, it was in, I believe in North Dakota. And so that was kind of interesting that, you know, that you find somebody that's slightly, slightly famous in a local area that are a part of these estates as well. Do you find people who are, you know, who are like, who receive something huge, like takes them to another kind of economic, uh, I did an estate several years ago where a woman, uh, we didn't think she had any family, but we started our search and she had a sister living on the streets of Los Angeles that mm -hmm. took us about six months to track her down. But she went from living on the streets to having an estate of about $750,000. Wow. So, you know, I, I think we did a good job there. Wow. That's pretty cool. So you have one where um, you had to go, like there were no siblings living. Uh, then there were no first cousins living. And so that came to step five, which is to research the grandparent siblings. So um, are you doing basically the same thing here? Well, you did a whole lot more genealogy first because we're looking at the grandparents. In this particular case, the decedent was born in 1929. Her parents were born about 1900. And then her grandparents were born in the 1850s. Uh, and anytime that somebody dies without a will, the estate is split into two moieties, a paternal and a maternal. In this case, we split it again into four pieces because we had to look at all the grandparents who were all born between 1795 and 1815, coming back down to look for the living heirs. Because like I said, here in Texas, 
we just keep looking to refine living people. And we've ended up with about 525 heirs to the estate. Oh my gosh. So no siblings, no living siblings, no first cousins, no first cousins. But then when you go to the grandparents, siblings, you came up with how many people? 525 heirs. Holy moly. And this is the, um, this is the the chart laid out on your floor. Yep. That has been turned into a chart that I'll take to court and plaster up on one wall. <laughs> That's a family reunion right there. <laughs> well, and the interesting thing is, is that these people that are inheriting, they never knew this woman. You know, they were so distantly related, they never knew the woman. So it was, you know, they were like, okay, sure, you know, we'll take it. But they never, you know, never knew her, so never knew her yeah so kelvin you know this was a great quick start and i'm going to run by the steps but i have i have another question for you okay um so these are the steps that kelvin shared with finding the heirs of the estate step one obtain the death certificate or obituary of the deceased step two research the deceased Step three, begin searching for the siblings. Step four, search for first cousins. And of course, for those two steps, you're going to use Kelvin's top uh, sites. He had top four, which is white pages, been verified, checkmate, and Intellis. And then, you know, you might need to continue to go to step five and research the grandparents' siblings. So, Kelvin, that was great. Like, I really kind of, I, I have been verified. I'm going to play around with that. I think I'm going to get like a, uh, maybe, I've been looking for other parts of my grandmom. So I might like use her, like somebody in her family as a guinea pig. What are some other like ways that, because we always hear about finding dead people. What, like, are there any books out there that you would suggest um, that we could get to help us to learn more about forensic genealogy? No. Are there any courses? Courses. Where can we get more about forensic genealogy? Because I think a lot of people want to know more about finding, because this really, it's not really about finding heirs. It's about finding other people who are connected to us. Well, if you're interested in forensic genealogy and all of its aspects, uh, there is a course taught at the Salt Lake Institute and at GRIP, the Genealogical Research Institute of Pittsburgh. Uh, myself and two of my colleagues, we teach a fundamentals course in forensic genealogy each year. So you can look at those websites to see when they're going to be offered. Next. Okay, so there are institute courses, two of them that you can go and take to go bone. So how'd you guys like that? Do you guys enjoy um so uh, Barb wanted to know, how do we get involved in air research? So it sounds like Barb wants to maybe do what you do. Is that I think that's what Barb is asking. Um, Dr. Abbott says, hi, Kelvin. It's one of my best friends. I thought I was your best friend. I thought we were BFFs. No, just kidding. <laughs> so how does Barb get involved in air research? Give Barb my uh, email address and tell her I'd be more than happy to talk to her. Okay, you can you can pop that into the comments. Um, Jenna wants to know. She said, oh, "White pages sometimes includes the date of death." That's pretty cool. Um, Jenny Watton loves the white pages as well. Oh, she's used um, to send letters to cousins to get pictures. Woo, go Jenny! Good Do idea. that research, girl. Um, yes, uh, Barb definitely wants your information. She is so interested in that. Did we miss anyone? We did not. Okay, let's bring on my favorite genealogist. How are you? So uh, Michael came up with the best question of the day. And I'm not going first because I don't have an answer to this. But Michael, what's our question of the day? And I want you guys to also, the guests, to to share your responses as well. Michael? Michael? The question of the day, what's the worst piece of genealogy advice you ever got? 
you don't have to say who gave it to you. We can, yeah, discuss, no, we can discuss that. We can discuss that elsewhere. But uh, no, this show is actually running on a two-second delay, so that I could bleep it out. So you can just know I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would have felt a lot more free with my language if I had known there was a delay. But <laughs> you know. well, I'll go first because because I I got to say I, I did have to rack my brain a little bit because I really received a lot of good advice Me and too. mentorship from a lot of people early on. But at one point when I was first getting into tax records, somebody uh, was looking at a colonial list from what became Lebanon County, Pennsylvania, and said, oh my, uh, they must have been in jail because they're listed on the tax list as an inmate. <laughs> yeah, uh, not so fast. Up until the 1840s, a lot of Pennsylvania lists were divided into freeholders, mm -hmm. so-called inmates that had enough personal property to, uh, to merit taxation, and then single freemen. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, so being, being an inmate is usually a good, a good marker that they are married. Uh, because they would be on the single freeman list if not. And in fact, it's been said that a lot of times the reason they uh, had enough personal property was from the wife's dowry. Uh, so to some extent, uh, being on that list uh, can be uh, kind of sort of proof of marriage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I would have to say that probably the one bad piece of information I got was about marriage records. And being here in the state of Texas, I, I put the person told me that, oh, look at a marriage record. You'll find the parents' names. That ain't happening in Texas. <laughs> we didn't start having applications till the 1930s. So uh. prior to that time, it's just the name of the bride and the groom and the person who married them. Wow. Chicago didn't ask for that information until 1964. Mm. Oh. Wow. But that's a whole other story. Do you have a piece of bad advice, Shamel? Because I'm still trying to figure out what mine was. <laughs> yes, and this wasn't advice <laughs> given directly to me. Because like Jim, I was blessed. I, I started out in a genealogy group, and I listened to what everybody was saying week after month after month, meeting after meeting, questioning my cousin, why are they doing it that way? Why, you know? But I heard someone um, when I was in, I'm not going to say where I was at, um, they say, oh, the social security application is useless. There's nothing on there that's going to really help you in your research. Yeah, and I was just like, and I just try to stay in my bubble. I try not to tell people what to do. And I said, you know, I'm not going to just break in and say, hey, you're a bunch of but I just waited because I knew the person was going to still be there. And I pulled the person inside and I said, listen, this is the deal with these applications. And they went, oh, and they went back and they corrected their mistake. So, <laughs> Michael, did you come up with one? <laughs> it was your darn question. I know it was because I, I wanted to hear your answers. I'm not saying I had an answer of my own. Um, you wouldn't yeah. make a good lawyer because you never ask a question unless you know the answer. That's, well, <laughs> then I I avoided the correct profession. I have one uh, more then. I have one more. I, I would say real quickly, I think probably it's not really the worst advice. Whenever somebody's given me an incorrect definition of something or has relayed to me a historical practice that really didn't happen without going into the details of those, that's going to be too long. Because those are the kind of things that can lead you down the incorrect path. You've got a, a definition that's not right, or somebody has made a generalized statement about how people used to behave or what was legal or whatever that is totally untrue, and you believe. So I guess I would just say double, triple check from independent sources statements you get. The world oh is God. filled with nuance, and, and, and too many people, including myself at times, Make general statements. I thought you were going to say the world is full of shit, but that nuance is a nicer way of putting it, I suppose. Listen to what Jenny and <laughs> Tina were told. 
Jenny was told not to contact a relative due to that they didn't want to be bothered. And she contacted them anyway and got pictures. Go, Jenny. Good for her. Tina yeah. was told the worst advice she got was families don't have more than eight kids. So if there are more than eight kids, make sure that the kids are really all from the family. Uh -huh. She said her grandpa was number 13. <laughs> well, that is crazy. I, I don't know how to suggest they learn how the, how kids are made, but somebody needs to review something based on that. Um, Mildred has yeah. a big question. She said her mother has been paying taxes on her grandmom's property. Her mother passed away. How does she find out to distribute this property? That's a see a lawyer question. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, because it's, it's yeah. one, it's a state none of us are from. There's that. Two, it's a C. Yeah, that's that's a that's a see a lawyer question. Everyone, thank you so much, Kelvin. This was fun. I'm excited to look for some living people. Michael and Jim, always, you're fantastic. Everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks. We'll see you in two weeks. Bye bye. Bye.